Jimmy. Aha. Captain, I think we've got them. Lieutenant! Gentlemen, break down this door. Quick! Yes, sir. Quick! Welcome to the Mad Max Minute. The old world has burned in the fires of industry, forests have fallen, a new order has risen, and the machines of war are driven with the blade and the gun and the iron fist of barter town in <laughs> Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, one minute at a time. I'm Rick. And I'm Julia. And today we're talking about Minute 89, which begins with Iron Bar stubbornly clinging to the train's cowcatcher, and it ends with Master and the children trying to abandon the caboose. With us once again, sent back until their task is done, are Cassandra Fredrickson and Norman Mitchell from the Lord of the Rings Minute. Hi, guys. How's it going? Hello. After all of that Iron Bar talk on Monday, it delights me that we're not done with him quite yet. <laughs> oh my gosh. I don't... No, 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 no. Well, that's just... It's just not possible that he's still alive. Yeah, that car split in half over him and exploded. <laughs> Kabuki mask is still intact, though. It's not even singed. He's covered in soot, not that mask. That's it. Oh, That's it. interesting. With all that hair flying about, you'd think the hair would have gotten it, but nope. <laughs> that it would have singed off or something like that? Yeah. That thing is indestructible. That is definitely a cursed object at best. Like <laughs> Right. Iron bar is just a vessel so. for its corrupted spirit. Probably. It's the puppet master. Yeah. It's gotta be. You can't cheat death through sheer force of will no man he's just rolling 20s on those fort saves all day (laughs) i know there's the whole like darth maul survived being cut in half because he was just really angry and therefore strong with the dark side but he stopped himself from bleeding out just because he was mad yeah it just dark side did a brother a favor (laughs) like this is mad max not star wars so you can't say it's the force or anything like that right and yeah his name is literally angry anderson But I don't think he's actually that furious to scare death away. Death's got a glass jaw and this man's coming down swinging. (laughs) (sighs) It's almost like Iron Bar was the subject of a weird prison experiment where his DNA was spliced with abalone shell. (laughs) And they created like a tiny Australian Luke Cage. (laughs) (laughs) You can't toss him. You can't crush him. You can't drown him. And you can't even blow him up. But his, his worst enemy is an otter. (laughs) <laughs> just the tummy of an otter <laughs> no. crack him open like no. an egg <laughs> it does make me wonder if there really is anything that can kill iron bar i don't know you gotta take that kabuki mask away yeah step one but then it curses you and you have to have a strong enough will to fend it off <laughs> yeah that soul has to live somewhere where did the mask even come from right (laughs) did did someone find a museum and raid it and was just like oh man this thing's pretty cool and they were the first victim of this cursed thing (laughs) you start me off on ideas that i never even considered before like where (laughs) where did it come from well master does wear a samurai outfit huh Mm. so maybe at one point someone did raid a museum exhibit and then traded those goods for food and fuel and clean water and whatnot. It's like, hey man, you want this katana for like five gallons of water? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I got these cool robes. Master took a liking to the armor that was just his size, weirdly enough, and Iron Bar took a liking to the mask. Or maybe the mask called to him. Yeah, maybe the mask took a liking to Iron Bar. (laughs) Right, he locked eyes in his kabuki mask and it was just like, you and I, we should get together. Yeah. (laughs) We could do great things. Would you like to not die? <laughs> Let's make a deal. You wear you wear me on your back like a proud banner. So no, okay, so Iron in Bar, full view of all. Iron Bar in this scenario then isn't Sauron, he's Gollum. He made a deal with this evil Kabuki mess. Who created the mask? <laughs> like... <laughs> the contract is sealed. <laughs> If he puts it on, he'll he'll gain true power, but he doesn't trust this thing to not dare. keep his body yeah. forever. Iron Bar does seem more like a golem than like a Sauron type. He's not so smart. He's just <laughs> tough as nails. I mean, he's called Iron Bar for a reason. Apparently. 
He's died four times. He yeah. keeps coming back. He's as tough as a bar of iron. Can't put a bullet through a bar of iron. Can't break a bar of iron in half with your bare hands. You can blow one up, though. Yeah, I mean, it's got to be real hot. <laughs> Jet fuel wouldn't melt that iron bar, Cassandra. Ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha. <laughs> what if this is more of a Stanley Ipkiss situation and the mask is legendary in origin? This whole idea that whoever puts it on gets amazing power. Then he's going to start dancing the Roomba. <laughs> exactly. Like, he doesn't want to turn into a green-faced, crazy-er version of Jim Carrey, <laughs> but he still wants to have some part of its power, and so that's why he wears it on his back and not on his face. So the vicinity still allows him some of the power of the mask. Yeah. Right. It's a loophole to the whole whoever wears this mask gets its power rule. And he's just like, I'm wearing it. Look, see, this is, <laughs> I'm wearing it. I'm not wearing it as a mask. <laughs> Why don't you just strap it to the back of your head, though? Well, then it's still going to get in your brain. Oh, I see. Yeah, you don't want a weird Lord Voldemort situation <laughs> yeah, <that's> where true. <laughs> some sort of weird mask is living on the back of your head. <laughs> Well, I mean, if it's like the mask, it could just turn your body around. Oh, God, that movie <laughs> is so scary. <laughs> oh, man. I already like don't like Jim Every Carrey time. because he scares me. Because and... <laughs> he actually has the face of like a horror cartoon. Yes. And then the movie just makes it worse. Oh, God. They made a cart. They actually made a mask cartoon. Oh yeah, for children. They did. I remember that. And you know, every time I think of the mask, I just think of the, the like the the dance club scene. That's the the only thing I think of every time I think of that movie. And then he goes outside, and there's all the cops, and he like dances through the bullets. He makes them all dance. So silly. Because like that's the thing. It doesn't just have power over him. Him wearing it gives him power over others. Wasn't that mask like the property or created by Loki? <laughs> Maybe? Is I the... think it's specifically like a god of mischief mask in that movie. That makes sense. Loki's just like, I'm just going to leave this on Earth and see what happens. Have fun, mortals. I thought the mask was African in origin, or is it... Honestly, it's been so long North since I've actually in seen it's the mask. African in origin, that would be what, uh, Anansi? Is that yeah, one of the... the spider. That's like a big famous yeah. one. Yeah, god of yeah, mischief. Yeah. Like one of the ones that's famous in the West, mm -hmm. as far as the name goes. I only know that because of American Gods. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right, let me see this whole list of Japanese deities. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be here for a while. <laughs> I know a few off the top of my head. There's like uh, Susanoo, Amaterasu. There's more. They gotta have like Ryujin. Ryujin is one, I think. Okay, it looks like. Oh my gosh, I. Ugh, this is not gonna come out well. <laughs> Uh, Sunanu no Mikoto, alternately romanized as Suzano-o, Suzano-o, and Suzano-o, is the god of storms as well as in some cases the god of the sea, also somewhat of a trickster god. Okay. So the mask that Iron Bar wears, being a kabuki mask in origin, and it makes sense, Japan is right above Australia, mm -hmm. with, you know, Indonesia in the middle, but you get what I'm trying to say. So you could have that mask on his back be the, I guess, mythic property of a Japanese trickster god, and that's why he's so indestructible. <laughs> he's the vessel for Susanoo. Yeah. yeah. I'll buy that. <laughs> We might have to ask the Studio Ghibli crew. <laughs> ask them what they think about it. Because they're always talking about that stuff. They do. They know about that stuff. Well, if it is the God of Storms, I mean, that, that skyline is pretty cloudy. So that makes mm -hmm. sense. I don't know about the ocean, though. <laughs> well, if there are ocean properties to that God's power set, that would explain why... Iron Bar was able to not drown in pig feces and survive a fireball. He doesn't need to breathe. And he he's can't be always set on fire. moist. He's always oh, moist. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> he's just always oh, slightly so damp. Gross. <laughs> Dr. So the fire just kick, evaporates right? the outermost layer of moisture. Oh. Nobody wants to be moist. <laughs> That's so funny. But yeah, that, that mask is untouched by this fire. Yeah, completely clean, despite the fact that Iron Bar is just blackened. But you know, what's all that soot from? Like, uh, a gas explosion like that's going to burn clean. Mm hmm And soot typically comes from, like, wood. And coal. And coal. Yeah. And, like, yeah. what did that car leave behind? <laughs> Not a damn thing. 
<laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was carrying a bag of charcoal. Maybe it was made of wood. And when the car exploded, the charcoal just... It was all the harpoons. Maybe yeah, they're the wooden. Harpoons. <laughs> no, they're not wooden. No way. Not to punch through a car door like that. Even with a metal head. Well, that's the thing. It didn't initially punch through that car door. Yeah, yeah we just don't see the second shot. <laughs> yeah. Or like iron bar hitting the back of the harpoon with a hammer. <laughs> Get in there. Or just punching just, just it. Just pushing it. Just punching it with his bare hands. <laughs> <laughs> like the extra 10 inches through pig killer's leg. Right. Through bone. Mm-hmm. Through metal. Through flesh. <laughs> and like a pe- like a Kevlar leg armor piece. <laughs> oh, man. I will say, watching these minutes out completely out of context is a lot of fun. Like, this scene is drunk as hell, and I love it so much. <laughs> 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 uh, especially next time. This guy also, like, Ironbar mm. also kind of looks like he's taking a nap. Yeah. Aside from the screaming. <laughs> He's just like spread out on the cow catcher like Fabio. <laughs> Iron bar in repose. <laughs> and I love how we get that initial shot of him looking to the side. And then in the next straight on shot where the train and all of the other vehicles are racing towards the camera. Iron bar is still just clinging to that cow catcher. <laughs> trying not to fall off. I don't off. even know like how. How is he not falling <laughs> It's like, it doesn't make sense the way he's even holding on to it. Maybe that's one of the other side effects of the mask is it also makes him a little magnetic. <laughs> maybe he, maybe he just is magnetic. If he's iron bar. Oh. Maybe he got so electrocuted as a kid. I'm saying, man, like that iron bar the Kabuki mask is on, that's just welded to his back. Oh, God. That's just part of him. That's why, he, get, yeah, that's why he gets away with like just putting the mask on that bar. It's like, that's a part of me. I'm wearing you. <laughs> <laughs> So he's sort of a combination Luke Cage, Magneto, <laughs> Stanley Ipkiss mask situation. I haven't thought okay. of the mask in so long. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> We keep getting stuck on the front of this train, much like Iron Bar is. Hey. <laughs> but there is stuff happening to the side of the train. Max successfully pushed the harpoon car in front of the train. And I guess this gives some of Auntie's guards a bit of a complex about how effective they're allowed to be. And they start pushing on the back of his car. Oh, we should do something about this ugly car. Yeah, Max is a little put off by the whole being pushed thing, but he's able to keep his car under control and veer off to the right instead of veering in front of the train. Mm -hmm. He actually knows how to drive. Yeah. (laughs) Unlike the guy driving the harpoon car. Harpoon car. Yeah, where's that guy? Oh, that guy's dead. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He didn't have a mask to protect him. (laughs) Yeah, he he didn't have any contract with uh, a primordial deity (laughs) to keep him safe. Why is an iron bar in charge? I know. We've often said that he more or less is. You've got Auntie up at the top. You've got the collector who's in charge of letting people in. You've got Dr. Dealgood who's in charge of commerce and trade in the town itself. That's a good name. Dr. Dealgood. And we always thought that iron bar was in charge of the guard. Like all of these. Maybe you have a military coup. Mm. Yeah. You can't kill him. You can't stop him. What are you going to do? I'm in charge now. (laughs) It's a good thing that Iron Bar is so loyal to Auntie. She doesn't have to worry about him turning on her. Or at least we don't think. No, I think he's very loyal to Auntie. It's a shame that because of politics, Auntie couldn't put Iron Bar in the Thunderdome with Blaster. Mm, That would not look good on paper, but it would be very effective. (laughs) It would have been a great show. Right? You know, doesn't matter what you throw at him. Especially if Iron Bar started whipping out some of those more exotic powers from that mask. He probably has, like, laser eye vision or something like that. (laughs) It can just, like, open its mouth and breathe fire. That's so scary. (laughs) But what if Blaster was able to remove the mask to knock it off? The iron bar. No, it's got to be bolted on there. It's like, yeah, I don't, I don't understand the question. The, the, the iron bar doesn't get separated from the mask. <laughs> <laughs> you go to, you go to like grab it and it bites your fingers. Like, <laughs> wouldn't that be terrifying? You're just like, oh, I hate this. Thing. Oh my God. It <laughs> it's just like alive. opens its eyes. Dude, that's so scary. Hisses at you like a cat. <laughs> Looks into your soul. Oh no, that is not okay. That is the stuff of nightmares. Well, we're pretty sure it's like malevolent in nature. So <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, this is some evil, terrible thing. <laughs> Untouched by fire and death. Speaking of evil and terrible things, and I guess that's being a bit hyperbolic because we see Auntie and her guards have caught up to the train. She's on her rocket car thing. <laughs> 
Tina Turner in her chainmail armor and her rocket car. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's interesting here is that Auntie is no longer driving. She is up in the passenger seat where when this chase started, she was in the driver's seat. So somewhere her and that guard did some sort of weird, oh, like do -si -do chair exchange thing. Gonna crawl over the middle console while the other guy crawls over you. <laughs> it's like you get pulled over by the cops. Switch with me. I don't have my license. <laughs> I have to wonder, when did they have time to do this? Did they stop at some point and scramble over? Or did she just hold down the accelerator and then slide off to the side of the seat? And it was this whole awkward thing. I just She went out the door and over the top of the car into the other passenger seat. <laughs> I wanted to make some sort of reference to a Chinese fire drill, but I was a little worried that it would be too regional of a thing. Like only certain people know what a Chinese fire drill is supposed to be. It's that thing where you have a car stopped at a stoplight right, and, and the passengers and all the car scrambles. Right. Everyone yeah. gets out and changes seats. So I wanted to look up about that. I've seen that happen in real life. What? I think I've done it once. Okay, what if I told you that the expression of a Chinese fire drill originated in World War I with the British Merchant Navy? What was their idea of a Chinese fire drill? <laughs> so, because we're dealing with the British Merchant Navy, of course, they're dealing with nations all over the world. So, in that beginning of the century era, Chinese sailors were considered to be the best in the whole British Empire for their discipline. Like when they were given an order, they would hop to it. They would execute it to the T and be very diligent and more skilled than other non-Chinese sailors. And so since Mandarin to English to Mandarin translation is really time consuming mm -hmm. and more or less undermines the authority of the British officers. Some of them decided to learn Mandarin and because they're British, they tried to keep their British spin on it. And so you'd have these proper English gentlemen trying to speak Mandarin. <laughs> With their proper British accents. And, of Wait. course, it would sound terrible. That's so right. you'd have all of these Chinese sailors who pride themselves on being super efficient. And they would get these garbled and nonsensical orders from these British officers who think they're speaking proper Mandarin. And so these Chinese sailors would be like, okay, I think I know what he wants us to do. We need to do it right now. And so they would just run around trying to do what the officers told them to do, but the officers told them gibberish. And so the British have a good laugh about, oh, ha ha, look at all these Chinese guys running around doing nothing effective when it's really them just not knowing how to speak another language. Yeah, because it's, you know, Mandarin is very tonal. Right. And if you speak it in a very accented way, it just sounds like nonsense. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. So the whole idea of a Chinese fire drill is something done very quickly with very little after effect. So hopping out of a car, running around it, and then jumping in a different seat. It's a lot of effort done very quickly with very little effect. Huh. Ah, I see. Joke's on the British, though. They suck at speaking Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, I don't understand your orders, sir. Right. So as we see Auntie and her rocket car gaining. We also see that Blackfinger is there as well and he climbs from a truck onto the train and he's still got his skateboard backpack thing going on because why would you stop and change? When when would you have time? Right? And who needs to? I mean, that's high fashion. But he's on the train. <laughs> Auntie climbs onto the train. I don't know for sure if they actually had Tina Turner climb from the rocket car onto the train. But when we see her clinging to the side of the caboose, that's absolutely Tina Turner. So she's on the side of a speeding train in this shot, at least. I can't imagine that she did her own stunts. That is just foolish. Well, see, that's the thing. Tina Turner was so gung-ho about being in this movie. I would not be surprised if she insisted on doing her own stunts. That's true. She was really into it. I mean, how could you not be? Look what she's wearing. <laughs> yeah. Like, you wear that? Filming a movie? Like, you better be having a ball. <laughs> she looks like a Klingon warrior queen. Yes! <laughs> yes, absolutely. she does. I love it. I could absolutely see this outfit showing up in Star Trek The Next Generation. Yeah. Right? It's like Klingon, like Worf's that. aunt. It's like warrior aunt. <laughs> Worf's auntie. Worf's auntie. It's just auntie. <laughs> it's just auntie. Oh my god. It's just, like, you know, ahead of her showing up on the Enterprise, he's like very... Nervous. He's, just, he's very nervous and he's 
everything has to be perfect for auntie. <laughs> you do not understand, Captain. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, I could just see the episode opens up. The Enterprise is holding orbit over this giant desert planet and Worf's back at his station. He's like, Captain, I know the leader of this planet. She is my aunt. <laughs> if you would allow me to greet her before she comes on board, Captain. Why is it like William Shatner all of a sudden? <laughs> Worf, sp- Worf, Worf spoke very stunted. <laughs> he did. He did. He was always pausing between words. That's fair. Whenever someone pauses between words, I'm just like, William Shatner? Is that you? He especially paused before (laughs) and after the word captain, like always. Yeah. Captain. You just imagine (laughs) Wesley beams down to the planet and he gets in a fight with one of the other kids and they try and throw him in the Thunderdome. (laughs) Picard has to come save him again. Oh yeah, Picard gets to fight in the Thunderdome and prove his worth to Auntie. Hell yeah. Then you get to see, you know, Jean-Luc Picard and Tina Turner. Just wrestling. And she's just like, Oh my. <laughs> In Next Generation, didn't Riker play the saxophone? Maybe. He played the, um... Isn't it the trombone? Trombone. Yeah. Trombone. The trombone. The, the bone. The bone. Oh, okay, so you could have... <laughs> play that bone, Riker. So you know how, like, we don't need another hero and one of the living have, like, saxophone interludes? <laughs> trombone. You could have Riker come down and play the interludes on his trombone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't probably wouldn't sound the same. All I know is I think Picard has a good chance in the Thunderdome. We've seen him use across next generation, you know, all kinds of different kinds of firearms, mm-hmm. swords, hand to hand combat, a crossbow. <laughs> 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 He's well versed in combat. <laughs> There's an old man who will kick your ass. Absolutely. Mel Gibson move over. <laughs> <laughs> Although, let's be real, if they had a Thunderdome situation where Wesley was on the line, if Worf didn't jump in at Picard's insistence, they could just send Data in there. Right? Oh, that's true. That's like, yeah. that's one of my favorite things. I think it's in, um, uh, is it in first, is it, might, it might be first contact. Like, Worf gets wrecked by a Borg and then Data just like steps up and beats, <laughs> beats two of them. Just like, I, immediately. <laughs> like, it's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot. That you were building up to the Borg, and so when you started with that B sounding word, I thought you were gonna say box. <laughs> <laughs> like a crate fell on his head and he got knocked oh, out no. like any number of times. And the data just like picks it up and it's just like, what is your problem, Worf? <laughs> <laughs> Lieutenant? <sighs> <laughs> but it's just they do that all the time in next generation it's like Worf gets beaten and then data makes it a non-issue mm-hmm. yeah he's a robot man right Worf is only there to show how strong and imposing the enemy is and data <laughs> oh. is only there to give them a quick wrap up to the problem yeah <laughs> data is the solution like seven times out of ten to most plots <laughs> Speaking of small elements that the whole thing revolves around, we get a shot of Blackfinger and another guard. They are on the train engine portion and they are crossing over to the caboose section, but they're crossing over the connecting pin that attaches the engine to the caboose. And we get an extra bit of lingering on Blackfinger looking at this pin because it's going to become very important on Friday. So we need to make sure that we all see it. We're all aware that this is the connecting pin <laughs> between the engine and the caboose. Right. We need to see it beforehand. We need to know that it's there. Right. We need to know that he knows that it's there. That way, when Auntie starts shouting about it on Friday, we can be like, oh, yeah, that thing. <laughs> the thing 30 seconds ago. She right. peeks through this window like I a I remember creeper. that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I love that the kids and Master are hanging out in the caboose just trying to stay out of sight, not trying to attract any sort of attention to themselves. And then Auntie just whoop, right into the window. <laughs> like I it's see un- you. Like it's Uncle Nutsy's Playhouse or something like that. <laughs> Uncle Nutsy's Playhouse? It's a UHF restaurant. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's from UHF, yeah. <laughs> okay. Supplies. <laughs> So Auntie's in the back window. Meanwhile, at the front of the caboose, this guard that we saw crossing with Blackfinger punches through the window, scaring all the kids. Glass flies everywhere. And then he reaches through the broken window and just waves his arm around as if he's going to catch one of them. (laughs) And that's so dumb because way closer to where he's standing at that moment is the door handle. (laughs) (laughs) This door isn't locked. It's open. He didn't have to break the window. He didn't have to try and reach through it. 
He just had to turn the knob. That's just to establish his power. Establishing dominance. <laughs> He's just, it's intimidation. He's just like, look what, uh, uh, I can I'm gonna punch my, this window. I can punch through this glass. Oh. It's nothing. <laughs> Doesn't he know that he's not a named character? Therefore, nothing he does will have any significance. He's not Iron Bar. <laughs> he can't just be punching through glass and getting away unharmed. <laughs> Oh my gosh. This is the most sugar glass looking glass yes. oh. I think I've ever seen. Yes, I'm so glad you said that. First of all, it's yellow and disgusting looking, which means that it probably was made cheaply. Well, the yellow and disgusting looking, I'll buy that because of where that caboose and that piece of glass have spent so much time. Right. Yeah, surrounded by pigs. It's surrounded by pigs. That place is dirty and smoky. Yeah, that's just like all the grease from the, the black smoke from motors. Yes. But once it's brought out into the daylight and the sun, yeah, it just looks fake. <laughs> but yeah, just the way it breaks with these huge pieces mm -hmm. of glass. It's just, ah, uh, if you licked that window, it would taste sweet. <laughs> it's like slightly burned sugar. That's why it's yellow. Yeah. yeah. It's just caramel. Yeah, it's a car it's caramel glass. <laughs> they, got, <laughs> they got a good deal on it because whoever made it messed it up, <laughs> overcooked it. Say, so that's why they got it is because it was on a discount. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they tried to make it in their own kitchen at home. They're like, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> eh, it works, I guess. Good enough. They're That's... using the kitchenette at the hotel. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds like something from uh, Mad Max 79. I know, right? They probably would have done that. So this guard, as he's reaching through the window, doesn't even get that much of a chance to be effective because Savannah swings in and just kicks him. <laughs> just knocks him out. It's like, everyone here is having such a bad day. Mm -hmm. And Savannah takes him out so quickly and then opens the door <laughs> using the handle <laughs> like a smart person. It's like, hey, guys. And then we get another shot of Auntie at the back of the train, like, grimacing. Because she's like, I can't believe I hired that guy. He's so dumb. You meddling kids. <laughs> so Auntie climbs away from the window. I guess her plan is to move around the side of the cabin so that way she can cut off the children that are now trying to escape. She sees that Savannah is bringing them through the door, so she's going to try and cut them off at the pass. Right. I can't help but wonder at this point when Auntie now clearly knows of the existence of the children, what she thinks about them. Where did these kids come from? Why are they here? Do they have anything to do with Master? Why are they helping him escape? To Auntie, this is all a complete mystery. Do Probably... you think she's really focusing on it? Well, before now, I would have said no, but faced with them, a whole gaggle, there's like four or five kids and Master. Master is really who she wants. She doesn't care about the kids, but she knows they exist now. So in her head, she must be wondering where they came from. What the from. hell are these kids? <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, prior to this, just in Barter Town alone, there are no children. It's like that city in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, <laughs> where the queen of the city doesn't like children, so she sends them all to the mines. I'm just imagining the oh. cow car flying. <laughs> right? That's why they cut it. That's why they cut the, the scene with the cow car flying. Chitty chitty bang it's bang. A little chitty chitty, chitty, chitty bang, bang. bang bang. Oh my god, is Iron Bar in charge of catching the children? He's the child catcher. <laughs> That's so funny because the child catcher looks just like Dr. Dealgood. <laughs> I can't get over that name. Dr. Dealgood is great. It really is. Oh my gosh. Just gritty, chitty, chitty, bang, gritty, gritty, bang, bang. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a great title for a post-apocalyptic movie. Uh, just gritty, gritty, bang, bang, right? <laughs> oh, man. That's just a great alternate title um, for Mad Max. <laughs> yep. Gritty, <laughs> gritty, bang, bang. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> That's your title of the Fury Road sequel, George Miller. There you go. Gritty, gritty. <laughs> yeah. Rick, in your spare time, you should rewrite the Chitty Chitty Bang Bang song to be Gritty Gritty Bang Bang. Oh, well, I'm already naming this episode Gritty Gritty Bang Bang. Okay. So. You're welcome. <laughs> Just putting that as a special note here so that I remember to do it. <laughs> Here at the end of the minute, as the children and Master are escaping the caboose, we see that Max is pulled up behind the train. He has recovered from being pushed off to the right and having to get back on track. Aha! Nice pun. And he can see Auntie climbing out around the side of the caboose. So he knows that there are nefarious plans afoot <laughs> that he needs to attend to. 
<laughs> so we'll be catching up on Friday to see exactly what Auntie thinks she's doing and exactly how Max is going to deal with that. So be sure to come back for that and we'll see how that works out for everybody. The Mad Max Minute Podcast is a fan project by Rick and Julia Ingham. The Mad Max franchise was created by George Miller and Byron Kennedy, is presented by Kennedy Miller Mitchell Productions, and distributed by Warner Brothers. Mad Max Minute is produced and edited by Rick Ingham. Our opening music is Verdi's Dies Irae by Daniel Batista of DanielBatista.com. And our outro music is We Don't Need Another Hero by MilitiaVox of MilitiaVox.com. Our home on the internet is MadMaxMinute.com. You can follow us on Twitter at MadMaxMinute, like us on Facebook by searching for Mad Max Minute, and join our Facebook listener group, Mad Max Minute Beyond Microphone. If you'd like to support the podcast, visit MadMaxMinute.com where you can check out our Tee Public storefront by clicking the store link join our patreon by clicking the support link or make a one-time donation by clicking the donate link thank you for joining us for minute 89 of beyond thunderdome we'll see you next time Over